Have you ever watched a highly complicated historical film that spans long stretches of time, features multiple storylines and feeds you exorbitant amounts of information and thought to yourself, how does someone even begin to write something like that? These films might have stories that extend across decades. They might contain dozens, maybe over a hundred speaking roles. They might skip from one point in time to another. They might all of the above. They might be epic biopics like Reds and Malcolm X, gonzo encyclopedias like Goodfellas and The Big Short, political thrillers like Zero Dark Thirty and Carlos, or all of them at once like JFK. And now we are going to list some of the strategies that great creative writers use to turn an avalanche of people, events and information into an outstanding screenplay. How to hold infinity on the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. As William Blake would put it. Ok, more like three hours. The average runtime of these films I cover is over three hours. The secret of these screenplays all boils down to one thing. The most unsimple of all basic things. Structure. There are three ways of doing things around here. The right way, the wrong way, and the way that I do it. Let's start off from the start. That is, the ending. Many of these films start in media res at some point in the future. Like the protagonist's death in Lawrence of Arabia and Gandhi. Or some memorable event, like in Vice and Casino. This type of cold open is useful to entice the audience's curiosity. How did we get here? Viewers will begin asking questions, such as how does an emperor end up in a prisoner's camp? How can a white-collar workplace become such a bacchanal? Who is this adorable old man all alone here? Now the audience's thirst for answers is properly wet, we jump back to the past to catch up. Many films, though, keep hopping back to the future. It's the famous framing device. Right then, you lose all and fall apart. By having the protagonist in the future, or present, depending on how you put it, talk about the past, you can journey to different points in history or simply gloss over long periods of time. In Bertolucci's The Last Emperor, Puy is expelled from the Forbidden City. A series of events will lead him to live as a playboy in Tientsin. But we don't need to see them. The writer simply cut back to his future interrogation in prison, where dialogue explains away this transition and its more complicated political context. In those days, they had a large international settlement. The Japanese thought it would be safer for me there. Finally, we emerge on a new point of his life without any wasted time. I became a playboy. Am I blue? Yes. Oliver Stone's Nixon is set in motion by the title president listening to his tapes, which catalyze every jump the story needs to make. Did Mitchell know about this? I don't know. Mitchell's uh, out of his mind right now. Martha put her head through a plate glass window. <laughs> Jesus. These guided flashbacks don't need to come from a frame story, though. Even linear films have the freedom to not be completely linear. A character might mention or think of something and we jump to a quick flashback. Think of a Bob Hollister, damn from Indiana. I approached him, some bitch near to murder. Oh, shit. Stone's JFK is practically built out of sudden flashbacks of this kind. Dr. Peters. There was a large seven centimeter opening in the right occipital parietal area. A flashback doesn't need to run from beginning to end every time. It might be intercut with the present. Malcolm X gives his opinions on marriage while he learns those opinions from Elijah Muhammad. <laughs> no, 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 we don't oppose marriage. We're not Catholic priests. We don't believe in celibacy, no. The terrific Colonel Pesh sequence in Oppenheimer is built out of intercutting between five separate scenes on the same subject. Wasn't confused before, but I'm certainly getting there now. Enough of flashbacks. Sooner or later, a film must settle down on longer, dramatic individual scenes. And the trick is to make them as economic as possible. To save the audience from repetition, a good scene should imply what happened in the past. It dramatizes what might have been numerous events as one single scene. Okay, so this part isn't totally accurate. You know, we didn't find Jared Bennett's housing bubble pitch in the lobby of a bank that rejected us. The truth is, um, a friend had told Charlie about it. In Lawrence of Arabia, we get one single scene to represent the bureaucratic quagmire the Arabs found themselves in after beating the Ottomans. They will not work because they are given no electricity. The electricity is in the care of the hurry. 
time. In Reds, John Reed tries to bring up his points in heated discussions and Radek makes it clear that the scene we're seeing is the culmination of numerous similar scenes we had no need to see. We discussed this during sixth session of this commission. We spent whole day today discussing it and you insinuate we are trying to dismiss the issue? And when it's time to move from one scene to the next, there's the simple trick that always makes the script feel more sweeping, if not even epic. Switching points of view. After Lawrence takes the maskers off screen, we cut to the British High Command discussing next moves before actually getting to see Lawrence trying to make the new government work. So we can't just do nothing. Why not? It's usually this. Switching points of view like this makes the movie's world feel bigger. What happens in one corner reverberates across the whole planet of the narrative. I can't believe that crazy bastard thought he could do that right there in Columbus Circle in front of 5,000 people and get away with it. I can't believe it. And there's a handy, if a little cheeky, technique that always works when switching groups. Dialogue hooks! A scene might end leaving an unanswered question that's immediately answered in the beginning of the next scene. In Gandhi, our hero has an idea and walks away in excitement. His plan is revealed by a dialogue hook that begins the next scene. Salt. Yes, sir. He's going to march to the sea and make salt. Or a scene might end with a line of dialogue that makes it perfectly clear what the next scene will be about. Whatever job he takes, make sure it's something quiet. Welcome to the Sam Rothstein Show. We're very happy to have you here this evening. Dialogue hooks help give the screenplay narrative drive. One scene follows another seamlessly. You're never at a loss on where the story is taking you. Switzerland? What the fuck is in Switzerland? Swiss fucking banks, that's what. It was ass covering time. There's this fun little screenwriting book with the irresistible title of Your Screenplay Sucks. 100 ways to make it great. And tip number 35 can be found all the time in these complex historical films. Rhyming scenes. That is, similar scenes at different points in the narrative are ideal for revealing how a character or situation changed, or didn't change. In The Last Emperor, teenage Puyi tries to leave the Forbidden City, but the walls are closed on him, and he discovers that his castle stands upon pillars of salt and pillars of As a grown-up puppet emperor of Manchukuo, he tries to leave the palace to follow his wife, but the gates are closed on him in the exact same way. Just as he was more a prisoner than an emperor as a child, he is a prisoner emperor as an adult. In Viva Zapata, written by John Steinbeck, there's my favorite use of rhyming scenes. In the beginning, Zapata makes demands to the corrupt Mexican president, who asks his name so he won't forget him. Later on, after a successful revolution, Zapata is now running Mexico. A similar delegation makes demands of him and when one of its members is specially abrasive, our revolutionary hero reacts in the exact same way as the politician he toppled. H-E-R-A The corruption of power shown in the simplest way. Because these films mostly deal with big historical events and larger-than-life figures, reporters are often present. Did he really say that? Well, of course you really said that, it's right here. There's a big role set aside for a journalist in Gandhi, the same in Lawrence of Arabia. Let me take your rotten bloody picture for the rotten bloody newspapers. Interviews are common techniques to deliver some fluid exposition. Your faith in the veracity of the major media is touching, Jerry. It indicates that the age of innocence is not yet over. And using different media like newspapers, newsreels and TV news to tell a story also helps to make the screenplay even more encompassing. Just like switching between the points of view of different groups, it's a way of showing how these narrative events have a big social impact. Ace, don't do it. Oh, no, no. No, no. Oh, Jesus. He's juggling. Two notes. First one. Of course, every technique mentioned here can be found in screenplays of all types, shapes, genres and sizes. But these specially complicated historical films are the ones that have the most to gain from them. Note B. This one isn't really a structural technique, but many of the films I'm covering here feature troublesome marriages. For some reason, these guys just can't get along with their wives. I'm telling you, I look at your face and I know that you're lying! might be a way to make their personal lives as complicated as their professional lives. Well, that is... What the hell are you saying? Think what you will. <laughs> okay, there's this huge storytelling method I didn't go through yet. Montages. 
that famous easy go-to technique that sounds like the slickest way of compressing events and information into biteable chunks. I defend that montages work best in two ways. One is when its short scenes can stand on their own as scenes. When they actually have conflict, development, personality and effective dialogue. That's what I'm good at, not to work, not to work. The presentation. Schindler's List has a 10-minute montage to set up his factory. And it never feels like a conventional montage because each snippet is so strong. Those cost more. Schindler acting like a greedy pig. Why should I hire poles? Stern taking every opportunity to save people. Skilled metal worker, he can make tin pots, he can make tanks, he can make whatever Mr. Schindler asks. He's highly skilled. And the secretary bid is wonderful. You need a secretary, pick one. I don't know how, they're all so qualified. I love this guy! Faster-paced montages, on the other hand, tend to work better with voiceover narration. Running as a South Pacific veteran, his early victories over Congressman Jerry Voorhees and Senator Helen Gahagan Douglas made it clear that to Nixon, politics was war. As Scorsese repeatedly shows in his encyclopedic films. And then there was Pete the Killer, who was Sally Balls' brother. Oh, I took care of that thing for you. Voiceover narration being, of course, also a common strategy in complicated historical films. And when the narration not only recounts events, but also consistently explains to the audience about sciences, systems, patterns, customs and cultures in a kind of information overload, then it's what I call an encyclopedic screenplay. But pretty soon, someone figured out that if you resisted the urge to sleep for just 15 minutes, you got a pretty kick-ass high from it. You definitely don't want a silencer. You want to make a lot of noise to make the witnesses run away so they ain't gonna be looking at you. You see, if a phone's tapped, the feds can only listen in on the stuff involving crimes. So on routine calls, they have to click off after a few minutes. The blue chips, top of the line, model material. They cost between three and five hundred, and you had to wear a condom unless you gave them a hefty tip, which of course I always did. You can check my video on the subject. And since you're here, also like and subscribe. And consider joining my Patreon. Moving on. Cold opens, flashbacks, intercutting, economic scenes, switching POVs, dialogue hooks, rhyming scenes, interviews, multimedia exposition, montages, narration, and then there's also this thing. Title cards. Lest we forget, films often use titles for time and location. I certainly find them more useful than those pesky title cards with characters' names and professions. They sound nice on paper, but unless it's for a really big shot, do they even work? How often do you skim these in a rush, then immediately forget them? Close to always, right? I'd say their usefulness is not in providing information, but a vague idea of importance. You might not remember that the fat bald guy is Lord Ezekiel Ebenezer Crookshanks III, Deputy Minister of Agriculture. But you remember he's someone important. If there are important people involved, then the story itself feels important. It's kind of a visual appeal to authority. And character titles might not teach you anything concrete, but they can count for style points. Paolo Sorrentino's Il Divo practically creates an art form out of its character titles. There's no way you remember anybody's name and occupation, but you'll sure have fun guessing how they'll appear on screen. This film might be unfollowable, but it sure is stylish. There are many screenplays not about real-life characters that are similar to the ones we saw here. Like Forrest Gump, Gangs of New York, Benjamin Button and The Godfather Part 2. And every single movie used here, historical or not, is a direct descendant from one single specific fictional film. A film that uses most of the strategies covered here to tell a complex, time-skipping narrative full of changing points of view, montages, multimedia and narrations. It's only natural that this brilliantly innovative and elaborate screenplay should influence every film attempting to condense an eventful life's complexity into a motion picture. Is that really your idea of how to run a newspaper? I don't know how to run a newspaper, Mr. Thatcher. I just try everything I can think of. And like Citizen Kane, most of these movies are biographies of powerful men. This was the power of kings, pharaohs, dictators. This is perfect. Power is the great, all-encompassing theme. That's too much power for one man to have. By examining power, a story can touch on every possible facet of society and storytelling. Kings are killed, Mr. Garrison. Politics is power, nothing more. Power is and has always been the one thing to rule them all. Power, Mr. Chairman, 
is the ultimate aphrodisiac. No wonder it's so hard to write about.